And our regular folks, we're glad that you're here. Let's look in the book of Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2. And I'll start reading there at verse 21. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinant counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands and have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, here comes the sermon. Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. His sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but it saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy fools thy footstool, or thy foes thy footstool. Fool, foe, be pretty good. Anybody's enemy of God. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart emotionalism and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want to take just the time this morning, if I can, to preach on that subject, the prerequisite to baptism. Now I'm aware that I'm in hillbilly country, so I'll define the word prerequisite. What that means is this has got to take place before that can take place. My daughter has a degree in psychology. I have to live with that. Before she could get that degree in psychology, she had to take certain courses. They were prerequisite. In other words, you just don't go down there and say, hey, I want a degree in psychology. I don't know why, but there are courses that you've got to take. Would you agree with that? I mean, you've got to know English and math and history and and uh, science and and uh, in West Virginia you got to know diversity. <laughs> that all that's required. Miss Elaine used to be a nurse before she retired. I'm sure before she went to nurses' school that she had to have some things. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying there is some things that are necessary before you are a proper candidate to be baptized. 
And I suppose we could lump all of them into the same category and say you've got to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ before you're an eligible candidate to get baptized. But of those things, I want to, I want to pull one uh, verse of Scripture, verse 37, and I want to show you something here that says they were uh, pricked in their heart. They were pricked in their heart. Now that word actually goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And, and the idea is that a thorn has pierced their heart. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is like a, a green briar. Amen. That, did you ever fall on a green briar? Yeah. We've got a whole county named after them in West Virginia. But green briars aren't the only thing that can stick to you. I mean, I hate nettles. Amen. Do you hate nettles? When I was a boy, we used to put food on the table by hunting groundhogs. Groundhogs always built their hole or dug their hole around a nettle patch. And I hated for a nettle to hit me right upside the neck. It would get my attention is what I'm saying. Amen. Of course, we've got uh, uh, locust bushes and, and we've got... Uh, uh, anybody that ever worked in the logging industry knows that. We've got blackberries when we try to pick them. They have a certain part about them that will, will prick your body, that will pierce. That's what the word means, yeah. that will pierce your soul. And I want you to notice that whenever these men were pierced in their soul, they said, we need to do something. And I submit this to you this morning. If God has never pierced your soul with that thorn of conviction, amen, you're not saved. You might be religious. You might have a spiritual, but, but if you have never felt that convicting thorn that made you realize uh, that you were lost and bound for a devil's hell and you was without hope and without God in the world and something must be done. And thank God I've got the remedy of what can be done this morning. I want to preach on that subject, not the net or the locust or the blackberry. But I want to preach on the word of God that pricked their heart when it was preached, that pierced their soul there on the day of Pentecost and pierced my soul many years ago and pierced a lot of you folks' soul right here in this building whenever you saw that it wasn't your brother and it wasn't your sister and it wasn't a preacher and it wasn't a hypocrite, but it was me that was in trouble with God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to pray. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, God, for these dear people that have came today to be baptized. Our Father, I pray that we'll have more. I pray, Lord, that folks will get saved. They'll want to follow the Lord in baptism. Father, they'll want to live for him all the days of their life. And, Lord, whenever they go to heaven, they'll be able to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Help me to preach just now. Help me to preach with power. I don't have any. Will you supply it? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now the preaching of Peter that day on Pentecost stuck in their heart like a, like a briar. And if I was to give you the theological definition, it would be conviction. And that is the number one job of the Holy Ghost of God as far as the world is concerned. John 16, 8, the Holy Ghost is here to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Now there's much argument in the Baptist circles today about this word repentance. Repentance occurs when I see myself as a lost sinner and I place judgment on my conduct. And that judgment is automatic. I determine that something has got to be done about my condition. And I have got to get somebody to turn my mind from the things of this world to the things of God. Feeling the effects 
of that briar in my soul. Repentance proceeds conversion. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Amen. Conversion is the act of change, and repentance is the mindset. Both are brought about by that knife of the Holy Spirit of God piercing into your soul because you heard the preached word of God. Not because you was in some kind of a spiritual concert somewhere, but because some preacher uh, had God's grace enough uh, and backbone enough uh, to rear back and say to the world, you're lost uh, and going to hell unless something is done. And thank God something can be done. Hang around, we'll preach that too. That's the necessity of preaching. Peter did preach on Pentecost that day. And they were pricked in their heart. They were stuck like a briar, cut like a knife. The sermon was the author of their self-judgment. God grants repentance. God gives repentance. God leads to repentance. Grace actually opens the door to grace, if you'll understand me. Peter's used to the keys to the kingdom. Somebody said, which side was he on? He was on the inside. Yeah. He opened the door from the inside. Yeah. I'm glad from the New Testament, the door can be open. In the Old Testament, when God shut the door at Noah's Ark, they couldn't nobody open it. But to us, he gave, hallelujah, yeah. he gave us a key to open the kingdom. The gospel of the grace of God will open the kingdom to whosoever will. The eternal law of God is unalterable concerning the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. Over in the, uh, uh, over, over in the Old Testament where it set forth time and time again and brought forth in the New Testament, the number one attribute of God is that God is holy. Amen. God's not like men are. Yeah. God cannot be polluted with sin, cannot be tempted with sin. God is holy, God is righteous, and man is unrighteous. Now Jesus Christ came to be baptized. And when he did, this statement was made, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus said something that puzzles a lot of folks. He said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Well, let me say this morning that every requirement of the righteousness of God is met in the Savior, Jesus Christ. There is not one requirement that he didn't take care of. Jesus is totally equitable in his character and perfect in his person and able to fulfill anything that God wanted done. He was able to do it. I can even want to do it and can't do it. I'll try to do it and fail to do it. But Jesus did not fail. Now his first public act was this. A, a, a symbol of his entire redemptive progress. I don't know whether you know it or not, but he walked 60 miles to be baptized by a Baptist preacher. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, preacher, you, that, am I telling it right? It wasn't John the Catholic or, or John the Episcopalian it was John the Baptist, and he walked from Galilee all the way down there to be baptized by a, I like that. Amen. That means to tell me that Baptist preachers have got it right. Keep going. Why? Matthew 3.15, to fulfill all righteousness. That was the purpose. Now, I ask you the question that Jesus asked the Pharisees, uh, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from men? Well, they didn't know, and they were afraid to answer, but I know, and I'm not afraid to answer. The baptism of John was from heaven. It was ordained by God. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was authorized by heaven to do the baptism. And when Jesus came, he said, If you'll baptize me, it'll fulfill all the righteousness. Now, the book of Romans uh, uh, clarifies Jesus' statement about the righteousness of God and it's revealed there as taking place without the deeds of the law. Yes. Romans chapter 3. Turn with me there, verse 21. I'm glad you're there. I'll start reading. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. 
For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That's the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ is my substitute. Amen. 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 When God looks, He can't see me. He sees the blood. And when He sees the blood, He'll pass over me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made what, church? The righteousness of God in Him. The righteousness of God that Jesus fulfilled was our righteousness uh, uh, taken in His account and caused His death, His righteousness taken in our account and given us life eternal. Amen. Jesus set that forth in a picture by his submission, whenever he was baptized, that's a picture of death and burial and resurrection. The soul that sins dies. Is that right? Yeah. Jesus did not sin. I don't know of anybody. I don't know of anybody in the right mind that would accuse Jesus of being a sinner. Yeah. So then, why did he die, preacher? I know why. Jesus did no sin, but it says right here in the book. He took my sins in his body on the tree. He died for me. Baptism prefigures his cross, his tomb. And that third day morning when he arose from the dead, the entire mosaic system, the entire 39 books of the Old Testament is fulfilled in that one act. Calvary covered it all. Amen. Everything that's needed there. All of their, quote, prayer times. All of their Sabbath days. All of their sacrifices. It's all wrapped up in this man named Jesus Christ. And if you've got him, you're a candidate for baptism. If you do not have him, you're not a candidate. Prerequisites what I'm preaching. Sin and consequences and trial and condemnation and punishment were all fulfilled at Calvary when he said it is finished. It is finished. Paid in full. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Romans 10, 4. When he was 30 years old, he submitted himself. He gave himself as a pledge that I will die. He died as God's lamb. He died as my Savior. His one purpose of coming to this world uh, was not that he was never swayed uh, by the kingdoms of this world. Uh, the devil offered him uh, all of those in the glory of him. It never stopped his mind. He had that one purpose. Uh, uh, yonder in the manger at Bethlehem, uh, uh, the shadow of the cross was over. He said, I came to give my life a ransom for me. Amen. Amen. He sought no honor from men. He got no honor from men. He died an ignominious death, but God honored him. And that day, full display was made at Calvary. Amen. But then full display was actually made at his baptism. We've got the sun in the water. We've got the Holy Ghost in the shape of a dove coming down. We've got the Father speaking from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. I've baptized a lot of people here. I've been here 30 years. I've baptized tall people, short people, skinny people, stout people. <laughs> I've broke the ice. Amen. I baptized them in July. I never heard any voice from heaven saying, that's my boy. But they heard it that day when Jesus Christ, whenever he was baptized, the voice came saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Threefold witness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and a threefold witness of his death, burial, and resurrection. We make such a statement. Christ died to sin, uh, or as, as we are, uh, he died for sin, and as we are baptized, we are stating 
that we have died to sin. And we're going to rise to walk in the newness of life. We're going to, well, since we're resurrected with the Savior, we're going to walk like a Savior. Amen. And not only that, but one day, even though the grave may claim our body, we're going to resurrect from the grave Amen. and live with the glorious Amen. life reserved for the children of God Amen. in the realms of glory. The preaching of the cross holds the central position in the fulfillment of the righteousness of God. And that righteousness is Jesus Christ, my substitute. Amen. As David was told by Nathan and Israel was told by Peter, Thou art the man. Yeah. You're guilty. Yeah. It's your sin. Yeah. And that the Bible said there, verse 37, prick them in their heart. Now, what is the requirement for baptism, preacher? Conversion. Amen. Brought about by repentance. Yeah. Preceded by that cut in your heart. Yeah. Right. Amen. <laughs> Conviction, God's side. Contrition, man's side. Godly sorrow works repentance. Uh, it is precisely at that point that the contact with the thorn, and like I said, the thorns have been around ever since Eden. You remember when man sinned, God said thorns and thistles, it'll bring forth to you. But it's when that thorn is felt, when that convicting sword, when that convicting knife pierces into your soul, that you have the opportunity yeah. to receive the Lord Jesus Christ yeah, right. as your yeah. Savior. Yeah. If conviction, that's why we say don't come down here popping bubble gum and laughing. Amen. If conviction hits your heart, right. hey man, I remember I wasn't interested in chewing bubble yeah, gum man. or tobacco right. or Copenhagen or anything else. Yeah. When that conviction hit my heart, I said, Randy's in trouble with God. It's at that point, understand that we choose of our own free will to receive or reject. In the book of Acts chapter 5, turn over there with me if you will, and I'll try to wait on you this time. Y'all so slow. Acts chapter 5. Same preacher, basically the same sermon. But look at verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart. And rather than saying what we're going to do, they said, let's kill the preacher. You see that? See, that's the other choice. See, you can choose to believe what the preacher's saying. Amen. Or you can get angry with the preacher and, and develop some way. Same sermon, the uh, same God, the same preaching, the same preacher. And he said, you've killed him. God has raised him. He's the Savior. He will give you repentance. They were cut in their heart and they sought to slay him. Amen. Sought to slay both of them, didn't he? Peter and John. Now, turn again to Acts chapter 7. And let's look at another preacher. Different preacher this time. It's Philip that's preaching. We'll skip a sermon. The sermon's about the same. We'll cut all the way to the chase. Look at verse 54, Acts 7, 54. When they heard these things, you see it? There's that thorn. There's that piercing. Of that word of God, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, I actually have saw people mad enough to bite me. <laughs> but most time that's in business meetings. <laughs> no, I take that back. Stephen's sermon was the same thing. It, it had the, a different result from Acts 2. When they were cut in their heart, uh, in, in the fifth chapter, they tried to kill a preacher. In this chapter, they did kill a preacher. Yeah, yeah, right. You can kill a preacher, 
But you can't kill his message. Amen. You know, people says, well, I'll whip you. And they've told me that. Yeah. And that wouldn't be hard to do. I'm 63 years old. Spent my life in the coal mines. Got bad knees, a bad back. My fists ain't very big. My stomach's the biggest part about me. You might be able to whip me. And you might be able to silence my tongue. But you cannot silence my preaching. Yeah. I'm telling you, it'll ring in your ears on the judgment day. And you'll say, I wish I'd listened to that preaching. Yeah. Can the Spirit of God be resisted? Can somebody hear that and be cut in their heart and walk out of this church and go to hell? Look in Acts chapter 7, look at verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Yes, he can be resisted. A convicted man can end up lost. Yes. It's on your shoulders. Amen. I guess that uh, 50 or 60 years that Esther Baptist Church has existed, half of it I've been their pastor. But through that 50 or 60 years, there's probably been several thousand people that have sat where you're sitting and resisted the Holy Ghost of God. And walked out that door. Amen. And never came back. And probably today. And I'm not trying to be anybody's judge. But they're probably sitting in hell today. Saying I wish I would have listened to that preacher. Yes. On the other hand. We've got folks like Logan. And Jeremy. Amen. And Tammy. And those guys back there in those stony people back there in the back, they, they listened to what the preacher said. They said, hey, I need to do something. What would you have me to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You must repent. You must be converted. Same Peter, same imperative. Make your calling and election sure. Can we tell? Can only take you at your profession. If you tell me you're saved, I believe you. Amen. <laughs> you ever notice when I walk out in that water? Upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I baptize you, my brother, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And down you go. And I'm such a stickler for it. If I don't get your nose under, you're going back. Amen. I'm telling you, it's a burial. Right. I wouldn't want to take somebody out to Tyler Mountain and leave her nose sticking out. Yeah. It's a burial. It's a symbol of death and burial and resurrection. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's exactly what being born again amounts to. I died to sin. Yeah. I was buried and I've arose to walk the rest of my life in the newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever felt that briar in your soul? I felt it. Did you ever get a briar in your foot, in your shoe? You go try to walk and every time you take a step, you say, man, something got to be done about this. You get one of those in your soul. Uh -huh. You'll say something got to be done oh, about this. Yes. Where? <laughs> like the old pilgrim said, where can I get rid of this load? Yes. Amen. Right. The evangelist said, well, if you go through that gate right there. Yeah. <laughs> when you go through the gate, the load falls away. Amen. I'm free. I don't have a briar in my soul. You say, what's the difference between me and you? The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Without it, I'd be a lost ball in the high weeds. But with it, my name's recorded Amen. in the glory land. Let's bow for prayer.